the planet Earth. Some call me nature. I am very passionate about the planet Earth. A living, breathing planet capable of sustaining whatever life forms we see fit to deposit on it. Spock, judging by the pollution content of the atmosphere, I believe we have arrived. It's the planet stupid. No, 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 it's the planet stupid. Our guide for It's the Planet Stupid, Belinda Weymouth, <laughs> eco-journalist and... Uh, Usually you have good news, you uh, come with uh, sometimes uh, mixed news, and sometimes, you know, we just have to take our medicine and the news isn't that good. Mm. But uh, what, can you, uh, what can you report to us today, Belinda? Hi. Hi. Uh, well, we've got a few things going on. Um, we could talk, I think, why don't we start talking about what's been going on in uh, California this week, these huge storms. Thank and you. what happened with infrastructure. Um, I sent you guys a link because journalists around the world were going nuts trying to show how Los Angeles was being deluged with water. And what did they use? They used pictures of the Los Angeles River. Now, the Los Angeles River, as everyone knows, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers came in in the 20s and 30s and completely concreted it. Uh, it's super ugly, but they concreted to make it really efficient when we had storms so that all the storm water would drain off the streets into this, you know, sort of concrete channel and out into the ocean. So it was sort of, um, I mean, it's, you know, what journalists do, we get taught to sensationalize and to dramatize things and to, you know, doom and gloom it and to terrify people. And so people were sh being shown these pictures of this, churning brown water in the LA River. But the LA River was actually doing what it's designed to do and it was working perfectly. The water was being channeled out to the ocean. I mean, obviously it's terrible because, you know, California's in a drought and we should be saving the rain. Yeah, you wish you could yeah. capture it all, but yeah, this is yeah, what yeah. it's designed to do. We're showing pictures of it now. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's and designed it this... to, to, to essentially mitigate a flood risk. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it worked, it worked beautifully. And they there were pictures taken around Studio City where it was really, you know, up at the top. But Studio City, it's completely regulated there, the flow. You know, they, they, they release water as the river can take it. And this river is 51 miles long and a third of it didn't even reach, you know, its capacity during these storms. And we had back-to-back -back storms. I mean, they're saying it was eight storms, you know, um, that started, uh, you know, over the weekend. So it was it was really tested and it got a check mark. It came out and it was a winner. And the cottonwoods and the willows that are, that you can see, not in this picture, but in, you know, they you see them in the riverbed. Well, these are floodplain trees and they actually survive on floods to spread their seeds. So um, this was an infrastructure win where we didn't have an infrastructure win and where uh, municipal uh wastewater uh treatment plants were absolutely overwhelmed you know we had horrible sewage spills and obviously we don't want to have sewage spills these are awful and there was an eight million gallon one that happened um out of an unincorporated uh, area rancho dominguez um the water uh, ends up in uh, the uh which is the beach it's the cabrillo beach and so it's the san pedro uh, and Long Beach area where you've now got this bacteria and chemical laden wastewater. And this obviously isn't good, but this is a thing that sort of the whole world is facing right now and the US is facing because our infrastructure is old. We need to update it. You know, Los Angeles County now has 10 million people living in it. You know, that's a lot of waste. Um, and so that wasn't a win, um, you know, health, uh, officials in the county say stay out of the water for 72 hours till the bacterial load goes down. Uh, the problem is, is when it's stormy, the waves are really good. So surfers want to get out there and surf, but it's, that's a toxic, you know, bacterial sure. load that you should not be subjecting your body to. Uh, and uh, the scientists who I've talked to, to at UCLA say, look, really, it's not 72 hours. It's not three days you should wait after something like this. It's actually more like 10 days for the bacterial load to really. I believe it. Return. I believe it. with, with yeah. that Im immense release of that bacterial load and, the, you know, yeah. that toxic brew. 
Yeah. Um, I'm not going to be in it. <laughs> I'm right, not going right. out I mean, and, and, But it's weird how, just on that point, how diehard uh, surfers are. They're like, uh, oh, my God, dude, I just I can't believe it. it, it man, this, it's so laden with things that are going to mess you up. Yeah, I know, man, but, I mean, you got to take your chances on this stuff if you want to catch waves like this. Um, mm. But so, so let me just uh, summarize from what I'm, I'm listening to you say. It sounds like uh, uh, media uh, overplayed the uh, flooding of the L.A. River anyway, because the L.A. River was actually all of those images you saw. That is exactly what the L.A. River is supposed to do, and it was yeah. doing it effectively. The place that we were struggling in Southern California was with the overflow of uh, – untreated water the treatment um center was overwhelmed with uh, with all of the with all of the uh, toxic waste with all the uh, what do you call that Epa, the you effluent, said, the, yeah, effluent. Sewage. yeah yeah yeah, exactly. yeah. So, so what happens is you know you've got streets that are flooding and all the water is spilling down manholes i mean you know water oh, right, you know, gravity right. it goes down and so it gets into the wastewater uh systems and it just overwhelms them you know they can't pump enough water out and they can't you know to get it treated before you pump it out if you've got so much water eventually you know you've got to just let it go um and you know unfortunately that's what ha what has happened uh and this is a this is a problem all all over i mean the uk has all these scandals going on right now because they're releasing way too much untreated sewage into the oh, water. interesting yeah, yeah, it's horrible. It's horrible. Um, what else do you have for us? Uh, so we've survived oh, the storm with the good and yeah. the not as good. Yeah, yeah. So I've got a, I've got a good story about camels, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. But I just wanted to talk about the uh, sun shield idea, the huge parasol in the sky to, you know, block basically the sun's radiation and heat from reaching the earth. Now. Right. These things. Ooh, it's a wild idea, but it just might work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. What could possibly go wrong? So, so things that have, you know, and I, I, I say this all the time on the show, and I really believe it. You know, it's an all hands on deck situation. You know, we need to be looking. At, there are no uh, bad ideas, is what you're. Well, <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not oh, saying that's that. not your point. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think there, there can be there bad ideas. There are a lot of bad ideas, actually. Is the well, point. <laughs> well, here's the thing. So the idea with this this current space shield. So we've talked about all kinds of things. You know, releasing. You know, planes. You know, flying around and around the globe, releasing uh, sulfur to stop uh, right, the sun's right. radiation from coming in. Uh, but these sun shields, and, and you know, they've talked about space bubbles and uh, going up there and, and you know, dusting. So, so this Israeli physicist has come up with this, you know, new idea for the sun shield. You know, well, the, the newest, and you can see it's a nice shadow that it's you know casting on the Earth's surface. Yeah, but, it looks great. What's the problem, Belinda? Well, <laughs> yeah, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> okay, so what he's talking about first of all is just a ten to twenty million dollar little sun shield that you know a hundred square foot one to prove his idea. Uh, but really, what we'd need because what they're talking about is if we had a big enough sun shield, we could actually if if we prevented two percent of the sun's radiation from hitting the planet, that would cool us down by one point five degrees Celsius, which would we all know is the magic number. That's, you know, we want to, you know, keep heating, you know, to that number. And if we could have this big sun shield that would just boom, you know, knock out, you know, that much heating, that would be great. But in order to do that, we would need a sun shield that would be a million square feet, uh, you know, the size of Argentina. It would, you know, floating up there in space, it would cost trillions of dollars. I mean, there's one astronomer who said, hey, we could take up a sun shield and we could attach it to a repurposed asteroid. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, yeah. I'm like, uh, my uh, head is you, why, All right, why don't you get started on that? Uh, uh, right. What? No, but, but, yeah. but the thing is, so, so the, the million square feet one is obviously too big. That's just, you know, we can't do that. So then it would be a series of smaller ones um, that uh, would give us this diffuse shade, you know, on the planet. But space is already filled with tons of space junk and debris from all the uh, satellites and the space travel that we've done. It's already a mess up there. You know, when astronauts are, are fixing something on the outside of their spacecraft, they have to be, you know, away from, they have to be in the, you know, what would you call it, the leeward side. They can't be where the stuff would be coming at them because they could get hit you know, by debris, it's dangerous up there. And we're going to put this great big thing up there and it's not going to be hit by 
you know, an unpurpose, uh, a not repurposed <laughs> asteroid and break it sure. to fragments. And anyway. yeah, when you, if you put this massive thing up there, it's a pretty good bet that it's going to be taken out and damaged and otherwise destroyed by various space debris, which uh, is destroying and damaging satellites that are existing in Earth's orbit all the time. So yeah, yeah it doesn't. Yeah. It do I mean, so you're saying just as a practical matter, getting something big enough is impossible and even if you were to put together a bunch of smaller st things they the survivability issue is a real one so well well yeah because then it's you know the, you know then you have to sort of think of the ripple effect like what does that um diffuse shade do you know yes we do need protection from um the sun's radiation but would we make it harder to grow crops in certain places sure. which is already sure. going to become difficult because of uh you know, the increase in temperature and uh, lack of water. So I just, you know, while I, I really am a proponent of all hands on deck and yes, you know, big technology, you know, you know that I love low tech, high impact stuff. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. But um, um, I, I just, I, I'm just slightly dubious of an intervention on this size in out of space, you know, out of space. And I do really, you know, when, when Jeff Bezos talks about, you know, all the money that he's putting into his space program because he wants to go into space to better save life on Earth, I always think, well, shouldn't we be saving life on Earth first, Jeff? Of, of course, that's I mean, that's right. Uh, yeah. dub dubious Don't we dangerous. already have a whole bunch of space junk out there just yeah. in orbit, just hanging out? We're going to add another big thing here. Yeah, yeah, no, and it's completely dangerous and terrible and how awful for us to be polluting outer space, you know, so... Yeah, I, I, I was just a little, uh, you know, gobsmacked by that one. But, but in It is great, you know, though, that we found this vast area that we can pollute that's not this other vast area that we live on that we can pollute. So I, oh, I, in great that point, way, Mark. It's, yes, it's that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was yeah, that's solid gold. <laughs> uh, so what else do we uh, – so, so help me with our, okay. our last few minutes yeah. here. Let's talk about camels. So uh, this is kind of really, it's not um, low tech, high impact. It's more low tech, you know, low impact. But I love this. Uh, they're using camels to help reseed Joshua trees. So Joshua trees are really, really, uh, and look at how cute that guy is. I mean, I know camels are super difficult, but they're sort of furry and fantastic. And, and the, the amazing thing is is there's a uh, a long extinct camel that used to live in the Mojave Desert and actually ate the fruit of the Joshua tree and would distribute this sort of like a hockey puck uh, uh, shape the seeds of the Joshua tree along with giant sloths who also lived there and they they would reseed the trees but what's happened in Joshua tree we had this horrible dome fire in uh, 2020 it killed 1.3 million trees. And then last year we had the York fire, which covered twice as much ground as the Dome fire did. So it's an incredible amount of destruction. And the uh, camel idea is great because they're very low impact in the desert. They have these big sort of, you know, like kind of plate sized hooves as opposed to mules or horses, which have a much smaller hoof, sort of about that big on a horse. And, um, and that does much more to disturb the topsoil, whereas if you're padding around on these scraping plates, you do less damage. And what they're using the camels for is to take the seedlings of Joshua trees that they've, um, you know, you know, laboriously, you know, sort of grown and gotten ready. And then they take these huge containers of water out to reseed the desert. And they go into the scarred areas where the dome and the York fire were, and they put down seedlings and they water them. Now, it's a real labor of love. Um, and it's, you know, uh, I'm not saying it's a perfect solution because it isn't, you know, the Joshua trees are facing uh, a very uncertain f future. It's getting hotter, there's less water, you know, are there enough camels to get the water out there, you know, to take care of them? And, uh, a lot of the seedlings that they planted between 2021 and 2022, unfortunately, have already died. Um, but there are camel owners who are getting out there and saying, yes, I want to be part of the solution. I want to come help. And and apparently we have really amazing camels here, like the you know Middle East and 
camel uh, races come to California to get our camels because our camels have been, you know, out in the desert and uh, selectively breeding as they want to and uh, not inbred like the ones, some of the ones. Camels oh, of course. Have. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. yeah. So we actually have this great stock of them. We have the high uh, end camels here is what yeah. you're saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Go California. <laughs> no, but it is. You talk about innovative ideas because we've just touched on a couple. This is amazing. We have a picture of it up now if you're watching on YouTube of a camel with with the seeds and water. And it's just, I mean, it's, it's quite amazing. I mean, the human race clearly hurling toward uh, destruction still comes up with some really innovative things. It's crazy that we, uh, we can't innovate our way out of our own, as I say, uh, uh, you know, self-immolation or whatever is going to happen. But it's uh, it's really cool to see some of these truly innovative, inventive ways that we are treating various problems, and this is one of them. So yeah, it's it's really cool. It's really cool. It, it's like the um, you know th these grassroots efforts. I think are amazing. You know, one of the things uh, that I was uh, really intrigued and happy to read was to, uh, talking about what small towns have been doing in Bolivia. They are saving little pockets of the Amazon, and collectively they've sort of created this mosaic of saved Amazon. You know, we keep on hearing these stories out of Brazil. You know that the rate of deforestation is out of control, particularly under their, you know, last leader, Bolsonaro, uh, you know, it's, it's down 50% right. with um, the silver, but in the, uh, in Bolivia, they have managed to save a hundred square kilometers, just these little towns going, okay, this is our little bit of Amazon. Sure. And, you know, these, these pockets of it. Um, so I think, you know, there are so many people who are headed in the right direction and there are all these, you know, amazing things that are happening. Um, and, you know, we just need the big things to happen. The no, it's true. Companies no, but, to but I love that you mentioned the small things because, you know, enough small things, as you've suggested and implied and just noted, enough small things add up to a big thing. So, yeah, uh, yeah, it's like all the cities around the world that are saying, hey, we're not going to have mandated uh, parking spaces for cars anymore because that takes up too much of our land and we need our cities to be greener and more sustainable. Paris has done this thing where if you drive an SUV, they're going to charge you 18 euros an hour. To I park saw it. that. I saw yeah, that. Yeah. That's yeah. So, because they want to be. Yeah, they want yeah. to be a bikeable city. And San Francisco and Austin and Minneapolis, they're doing the same things. It's like we're not, we don't want, you know, car parking spaces. We don't want these big cars. We're going to make it harder and harder. We need more green spaces in our cities. This will help, you know, keep them cool and livable. So it's you know. so wild. Yeah, that, that story out of Paris, it just jumped out of me that they, you know, they're, you know, as we're driving these huge SUVs and pickups and all the rest, I mean, in Paris, they're saying, great. You want to park them in here? You want to drive it in here? It's going to cost you. There's going to essentially be a tariff on those bigger vehicles. And um, mm. they want that greener space and they want uh, a livable city as the city's population expands. Uh, love talking to you. Thank you, Belinda. You can find Belinda Weymouth across social media. Weymouth is W-A-Y-M-O-U-T-H. And you can find her here on Thursdays. And thank you for getting it all in as we uh, had a conversation with David Katz because of the Supreme Court case and getting David on and everything was a little tricky. So um, I really appreciate you always being so flexible and lovely. And uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. It's my brand, Mark. <laughs> Belinda away with everybody. That's It's the Bye. Planet Stupid for today. More It's the Planet Stupid. No, no, no. It's the Planet Stupid. Next time, only on The Mark Thompson Show. Hi, it's Mark, and I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell. You'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped, and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.